The topic of my presentation is centralised protection and control systems and it's part of a NIA funded innovation project that we're running. So the main points of the topic are about how to specify the system, how to carry out all the testing and all the, uh, you know, the assessments that need to go uh, to make sure that this system goes in safe and reliably and we can uh, continually repeat this process over and over again to implement it in the wider scale system. It's important to us that we need to try and digitise all the information that we can collect from the substation and that's all part of the wider smart grid strategy. It should have a significant impact on the industry to see the confidence that some of the network operators are starting to pick this technology up and look to implement it in a, in a smart grid network environment. We started looking for a different architecture to deliver the DSO strategy that we need to be prepared for, uh, mainly because of the, the, the huge growth we've seen in, in distributed generation, or DERs, as we, we try to sort of box them up as now. We've got just over nine gigawatts of DERs connected to the network, uh, which, is, which is a huge challenge. We're seeing storage uh, coming onto the network now. Uh, we've got a gigawatt of accepted storage offers that will be coming onto our network as long as the commercial elements are, are sensible for the, for the end users. And a huge growth in electric vehicles. So we've got just under 200,000 plug-in vehicles uh, that were sold in the UK. 31% of them are, are going to be moving around our network, which presents its own challenges. So we used to have two slides. We used to have the... Uh, the current world and the world we're going to be moving into, but uh, we, we did call it the new world, but it's actually here now. Uh, we, we've got this network and it's operating um, quite sensibly at the moment, but as that grows and, and, and needs more uh, pressures from the regulator to make sure that we can uh, cap the spend that the end customers have to pay to connect to the network. So we're under extreme pressure from the regulator to, to make that more flexible. So if you look at the, like I said, 45,000 protection relays on the network and a large proportion of them are the electromechanical. So the information you can get from an electromechanical relay is extremely limited in terms of the, uh, the data and what intelligence you can apply for it. So we've, we've moved through the different um, phases of the protection uh, architecture, if, if you want to call it that. And... The final stage, uh, approximately, if you speak to most manufacturers, they'll say the products move in sort of 15, 20-year cycles. Uh, so the main workhorse um, then becomes the old technology and the new one's coming along. So the, the new one that we're exploring at the moment is the centralized protection, which I'm going to talk a lot more about now. So in summary, why, why we need a centralized protection architecture is uh, you know we, we've seen huge changes in the network and, and we need to we, we need to think completely different we can't keep on applying the same protection and control systems that we have for the last sort of uh, 10 10 15 years with the numerical devices uh, so we need a technology that can be deployed rapidly we've got a huge amount of electromechanical devices that need to be replaced really quickly and that's resource constraints, cost constraints, so, so we really need something that can be deployed really quickly. And the technology uh, that's required, uh, we need to demonstrate to the regulator that if we're going to start spending uh, a huge amount of money on this technology, deploying it and getting the smart uh, grid capability that we need to, to manage the network much better, uh, then we need to show overall Tortex um, cost reduction, so we need to show the efficiencies for that. Okay, so our approach, so again, this is a pilot project. Uh, our approach might not be right for everyone, but I thought I'd share it and see what the other utilities have, uh, have managed to look at. So we've got uh, international standards like IEC 61850, of course, and uh, we have an abbreviation, the ENA, if anyone's not familiar, it's the Energy Networks Association, so the DNOs in the UK, we all sit on those panels and we look at the IC standards and we uh, try and uh, provide some national standards that we all uh, do shared learning from. So it's quite a useful vehicle for us to interpret and get some consistencies across the UK, how we're going to apply those uh, international standards. And then, of course, we've got the UKPN standards. So we take the international standards, we look at the national standards, and then we, we create our own specific ones if there's any shortcomings that we 
that we uh, see that needs to be uh, uh, progressed. Okay, so when you look at a centralised protection and control system, we sort of thought, right, okay, we, don't, we no longer have functions in specific boxes. You have a box that has a lot of functions, so we needed to think about how we were going to assess that technology and specify it in a consistent way and, and, and a repeatable solution. So we decided to split it into different uh, aspects of the assessment. So it, it's not drastically different what we do with uh, current protection devices, um, but you'll see from the functional assessment side, we, it is quite a different concept. And I think the manufacturers would welcome this, this type of approach in speaking with them about it. So we're gonna split it into the hardware assessment. So we're gonna be assessing the um, protection IEDs or uh, centralized IEDs, if you want to call them. So we're gonna look at the environmental aspects, which we, we, we use a, a technical specification for 8-5, which is from our national suite of libraries, which is a, a combination of uh, a, a lot of the uh, IC or BSEN, as, as, as we call them in the UK. So that goes through all the uh, seismic tests, all the transient bursts, um, and all the temperature changes that we'd expect to experience in a, in a substation environment and make sure that the product is fit for being in a substation environment. Then we do a functional assessment. So again, we have some national standards which are sort of born out of the 60255 group where we do some additional modeling and we build some network models and certain X over R ratios that we look at some of the line diffs, for example, and distance protection. We then do a, a UK power networks type approval. So once you've got your product, the hardware is assessed, the function is assessed within that hardware, then how are we gonna apply it in our network? So we need to do UK PN type approval tests and make sure that we configure um, you know, all the, all the functions in a consistent way so we don't confuse all the operational staff. And then of course, then you need to identify the training requirements. So if you're rolling out a new product, centralized protection, no different than anything else that you would put on the network, you need to make sure that the appropriate training is identified and rolled out to the operational staff to make sure you get full engagement. Okay, so that's just a, a, a quick summary. So when we look at the hardware, and when I talk about hardware, I'm not just saying a box, I'm talking about component elements in there. So it's not uncommon for a manufacturer to say, okay, the power supply that we you currently approved, we're now changing that, we're putting some different components. So we'd expect to split those hardware components into individual cards or slots or, or whichever way the manufacturer does it. So we can assess them uh, individually, so we're not repeating what we do at the minute where we have multiple uh, protection devices with the same power supply and we seem to be assessing the same devices over and over again for the same uh, for the same modification okay so that's the hardware so we've got that assessed and now we're looking at the functional assessment of the individual protection functions um, the, the, the one apology I've got for this presentation is this is based on a, on a line differential function, which you know I don't want to give the, uh, the impression that a centralized protection systems that we've been looking at have this, they don't. I would like them to have it in the future uh, so we can reduce the number of boxes. Like I said at the start of the uh, presentation, we want to reduce the footprint. So this is based on TS486-2, which is a national standard, which is again born out of a lot of the IEC standards. And it's a typical piece of network on the National Grid Transmission System, which has challenge in X over R ratios. So we have a model that, that sort of tests that and makes sure that the function performs as expected. So we do threshold tests on that. We check the operating characteristic time. We look at fault indications, event recording. We do exercises like extracting uh, or, or, or taking a com trade out of a relay whilst a fault occurs. So you can do online uh, data extraction. Then we do, um, we have 107 different fault cases that we run this function through uh, to make sure that it performs consistently on the different types of fault types that we, we like to see. So we call that dynamic testing and we look at evolving faults and switch on to faults and a few different scenarios that we like to see before we put anything on the network. Um, so what we did is we, we did system-based testing, we built that network model, and uh, we did some RTDS testing on the particular product that we did this for, and we compared the, uh, the RTDS testing with the, uh, with the 
uh, the model that we built as well to make sure there was consistency. And then we've got a set of comp trades that we can use to, to do repeatable, consistent tests of this type of uh, specification that we're looking for these functions to achieve. We then um, also did the threshold tests and the dynamic testing we combined into one uh, consistent test document that we can repeat over and over again to make sure all the uh, manufacturer's algorithms are tested in a consistent way. And uh, to be fair, you know, we're not asking certain vendors to, to, to perform differently to others. So. so you can see the advantages from that. Uh, we've got compliance with the standards that we're specifying. So when we specify we want a function, we, we, we basically test them uh, consistently for all the different vendors. Uh, the, the three particular vendors that we're looking at for the centralized pilot project are the, uh, the GEV60, the SSE600, and the Cipratec 5 uh, 7UT device that we're using. You've also got a consistent assessment method across all the vendors uh, that you're applying to the network. So there's no inconsistencies there. Cybersecurity patches, we would like to get to a point where we can apply cybersecurity patches very quickly so we can do a lab environment, apply the patch, run the full suite of tests again, which takes about 15 minutes, and then say, yeah, this patch is good to go. So we can roll this out and we can be confident that the, the algorithm's still gonna perform as we expect. Uh, the 61850 data attributes, if we specify in the SSD that we want specific data attributes from these functions, we can check that they're working as well and feed them back into the test and make sure that those data attributes go active when we'd expect them to. Uh, the network model can be easily modified if we have a specific project issue, a query, or, or something that uh, the project teams are, are asking us to look at in asset management. We can, we can modify the model quite quickly and just re-perform the full suite of tests again. And new functions are upgrades. So if we're looking, uh, if we've got a centralized scheme that doesn't have a differential algorithm in and an interconnector comes along and we want to put the differential algorithm in, we can have a digital twin type environment that we can assess and, and make sure that it performs as expected. Okay, so that was the, um, that was the, the, the hardware's being assessed and the functions are being assessed within the, uh, the centralized device. Then we start getting into the, uh, the SSD specification, so we're moving into getting a bit more specific into the UKPN type approval. Uh, that's using the SEL files, of course, and also we're looking at the 61850 system-based testing, UKPN engineering technical specifications, and then, of course, the 61850 analysis to make sure it performs as, as expected. So just to give you a little bit of background as to um, where we are now, we don't use 61850 at all. We've got two substations, which were pilots on our network quite a few years ago at the station bus level. Um, and we've, we've never really uh, took off with the, uh, with the standards. So that, that was a little bit disappointing when I started this role in asset management uh, two years ago. I said, we need to change that. We need to start using some of the architecture that's available in this standard. So, we, so when I did this pilot project, we had no 61850 specifications, so I had to start from ground level. And uh, the utilities that, that don't use 61850 at the moment, um, we, we were there probably back in February. So I only wrote the, uh, the GAPE project for this and got the funding back in February. And uh, it doesn't actually take that long to get these specs drawn up when you start uh, digging into the standard and, and speaking with your suppliers and, and, and other utilities. So what we did was we, we, we stuck our head in 7-4 and we looked at all the different logical nodes that we, uh, that we wanted to use. We took an opportunity to revisit our symbol blocks in the standards and uh, look at 60617, which most of our engineers were more f familiar with those descriptions. We also put the ANSI in IEEE because we use 52A and 52B. We have a bit of a mix of some of the ANSI and the IEC uh, symbol blocks and then of course the 61850 so it gave our engineers an opportunity to look at something that was consistent with the 60617 numbers and then the new 61850 description so it wasn't completely new for them what we did then is we looked at the mandatory and optional uh, requirements uh, from some of those function blocks and then what we did is said well actually um, yes we'll, we'll have the mandatory or, or, or we, we we're not uh, completely against saying, well, actually, we don't need the mandatory, but if it's there, it's fine. 
and we, we want to look at some of the future strategies like um, remote extraction of protection settings. And so we've, we've decided to make some of the optional elements in the standard actually mandatory for UK power networks. We then um, basically put pen to paper and started using these symbol sets and, uh, and drafting up how we wanted the bay control stroke protection unit uh, to interact with the centralized protection and uh, how we wanted the goose control blocks and the binary inputs and, and all the usual things that you need to specify at the SSD level. We then looked at the sample value streams and the sample rate that we wanted those sample value streams to be communicating that between the protection devices and between the disturbance recorders. So we specified that and we also specified the data attributes of the signals that we wanted to take back to uh, the MMS reports into the RTUs. We then did, of course, the top-down approach, which is the, uh, you know, the sort of uh, best practice guide. So we, we took the logical nodes that we specified in our standard diagrams. We then virtualized the IDs. And uh, what we did is we looked at the ICD capability of the uh, protection devices that we were looking to use. And then, of course, you've got to link it. So um, we then took the SSD file and linked it to the ICD file and made sure that the capabilities were linked uh, as we wanted it to. OK, so once you've been through that process, and like I say, we only started this back in February, so it, it didn't take that long for us to, to really sort of uh, pull this together. Uh, a bit of blood, sweat, and tears as well, but um, yeah, you get there eventually. Then we we publish our engineer and approval standards. So we say, okay, this is the logical nodes we want to use. These are the data attributes, uh, and if we're using a, a Supertech five device, this is exactly how we expect um, these to be linked together. So if there is a logical node that's not available, like SIMG or something like that, for your falling and, and low gas pressures, and they want to use a, a GGIO, for example. Okay, it's uh, not ideal, but you know it works. So we, we don't rule out anything. We still allow a little bit of flexibility for the uh, for the vendors to, to to comply with our SSD. And then of course we archive the the reports. So we've done all this testing assessment. And if anyone says why did you put this box on there? How did you do it? We've got all the documentation to support that. Okay, so we'll move on to uh, how to maintain. Uh, a centralized protection and control system, uh, well, we don't. So the reason we took this data-rich environment was we have a Totex spend of about six billion over the reg period. So if you can make a 1% dent in that, that's a huge cost saving that we can demonstrate to the regulator that we're making efficiencies in the way we run our network. So if you get all this data-rich environment back, then why do you need to go and maintain it unless it tells you that there's a problem? And that uses your limited protection and control resources uh, far more efficiently than sending them every 12 years or whatever your maintenance program is to keep on injecting those relays and keep on getting the same results out. You need to start thinking a lot differently and smarter with the way you do things. Cybersecurity patches, like I say, with the method that we looked at, we can apply the patch, do regression testing, make sure that patch has no impact on the algorithm, and then implement it in your live system, and then you can run some testing to make sure, uh, it, you know, we always want to, people in the field always want to test something once they've changed it, so you can do that. It's an automated plan. You can, you can run through the, the routine, no problem. Upgrades and extensions. So if, you know, the most common thing is, oh, centralized protection, how do I put another bay in? How do I um, uh, uh, change something from an uh, auto-reclosing feeder to a unit-protected feeder? Um, so these are, using this method, we, we can do a, a, an upgrade, no problem. It's not a concern for us. So we, we will be trying that out as part of the trial to, to see we've got some spare bays on the specific site that we pick, so we can change them from a unit-protected feeder to an auto-reclosing feeder or a distance feeder. We, we, we're going to... We're going to try that out and get that documented and maybe presented a, a future presentation. Okay, so we, we, I'm quite keen. Um, I mean, my background was I was commissioning for uh, 17 years or something, and I always did threshold testing and settings and quality control and all the usual things that we do when we commission. And when I've seen some of the tools that are becoming available in system-based testing, I started questioning, well, you know, if I put a wrong setting in, 
and I do a threshold test and confirm that wrong sentence being applied, what really have I uh, proved here? I've proved I've put the wrong setting in, which isn't really uh, great. So we're looking at system modeling where we're going to actually put the network parameters into the, in, into the model and actually run through 100, 200 test cases, whatever you want, and um, you know, it's, it's entirely up to yourself. So we can look at faults all the way down the feeder, halfway up the feeder. Uh, we, we can do a lot more robust testing and see if the protection settings engineers have actually put a reasonable setting in there or not. Um, yep, so that's uh, system-based testing. So this is the system. Um, we specified a general arrangement design, which you can see on the left there, and uh, that includes the HMI. We've got uh, the redundancy that we went for. We went for the Rolls-Royce, of course, because it's a pilot project, but I think when we start looking at the costs and the... Um, you know, the real life business as usual solution, we might, we might start losing some of that redundancy. So we've got a main SSE uh, 600 device and we've got a backup and we've got PRP, LAN A and LAN B, redundant uh, communications as well. We retrofitted this onto an existing substation which does have numerical protection relays on there. Uh, the device will be sitting as a passive device. So it will be listening and, and seeing what's happening on the, uh, on the CTs and the VTs. We took an opportunity to solve a problem which we have on a lot of our uh, substations, which is we, we have no way of measuring megawatts and megavars and all, all these instrumentation that we need to, to look down the feeders to see what these DERs are doing down there. So we uh, set a challenge to ABB, and, 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 and they did a very good job, actually, to uh, use switchable like a switchable sample value stream from the voltage, so the VT inputs on the incomers, uh, we can actually, depending on the uh, status of the switch gear, we can actually use like a voltage selection buzz ring would be used. So if you've got the incomer and the bus section closed on one side and the other incomer's out, we actually publish sample value streams on the voltages to the, uh, the other MMX used so we can actually see the watts and vars down, down each independent feeder as well. So that was... That was a good, uh, good piece of work that we did when we specified that. Okay, so this is the substation. It's an LMKV uh, uh, distribution substation, and it's on a, a rather large site that we've got, which is uh, 132 KV. We've got two 11 KV sites, one of which uh, is, is this one. Uh, we've got 33 KV there as well, and we've got five transformers there. So. We put, picked this particular site because there is quite a bit of fault activity. It's got overhead line, it's got cable circuits, it's got double wound transformers. There's 33 kV there, there's 132 kV there, and we will look to expand this pilot to cover those different voltage levels as well. Okay, so that's a single line. So we, we selected... Um, 80 samples, obviously, for the protection functions in there, but our power quality department were very keen that if I'm, you know, well, I was very keen to get rid of power quality meters off the incomer. So uh, they said, yeah, okay, you can um, get rid of the device as long as you give us a, a 256 sample uh, waveform that we can have a look at. So I said, okay. So we picked a merging unit on the incomer that could also... Uh, published two sample value streams, one at 80 samples for the protection functions and one at 256 for the power quality measurements as well. Okay, so this is the communication architecture of the different uh, equipment that we've got installed on this pilot. So, like I said, it's PRP, it's uh, redundancy. We've got two LAN switches. We are doing full uh, process bus, so we've got sample values, goose, uh, everything all going back to the centralized protection equipment. Uh, there's the MU320s, which uh, not only provide an 80 sample uh, uh, sample value stream, they're, looking, they're publishing 256, which goes back to the disturbance recorder, uh, which also has uh, PMU capability and, and other wide area uh, systems that we'd, we'd like to look at as an extension to this project in the future. Okay, so the footprint. Um, everyone always says, why do you need to do this in distribution substations? Um, you know, is there really a business case there? Well, like I said at the start, we want a data-rich environment, so it's not just about sample value streams, it's about the data attributes that you can get from the logical nodes available in the 61850 architecture. 
And also this site, because it's 11 kV, 33 kV, 132 kV, it's not just 11 kV. So there is applications that you can uh, gain value from. So this is the 11 kV relay room, which just has the two incomers and the AVC panel and the usual things you would expect to see down there. Two battery systems, and then up at the 132 kV relay room, we've got all the feeder protection on there, all the distance protection and everything looking on the 132 lines. Another set of uh, 110 and 48 volt battery systems. In pops the centralized protection panel. Uh, we designed it, we particularly tried to cram as much as we could in one panel to maximize the reduction in the footprint that we can achieve, uh, which was much to our electrician's uh, disappointment, but um, they had to do it. And that's what we're looking at. So we're looking at significant footprint savings in install, uh, installing the centralized protection system, which people say, well, okay, you know, if it's in the middle of the countryside, there's probably not so much a demand, but when you've got a lot of your network sitting in central London, which is huge real estate value, if you can save uh, even a postage stamp, that's significant uh, cost there that you can save when you're planning new substations. But the other, we don't just want to reduce footprints just for cost of land. There's, there's, there's other important reasons why we might want to in, uh, reduce uh, the footprint, and, and, and that's we might want to put an additional bay in there. Generator might want to come along and reinforce the, uh, the system. Or uh, we might just be looking to replace protection. So if you've got a relay room that's rammed full of uh, relay panels and you want to put new protection on there, you've got to do it circuit by circuit, which is network risk, if you have another fault on your N minus one network and you lose customers, there's CML costs, which is incentive revenue that we, we need to make sure that we uh, preserve as well. Okay, so if you want some more information on this project, it's early days. Uh, we have got the equipment on site. We have done the site acceptance test, but we are looking to try and learn and share as much of that learning as possible on how to do uh, testing, maintenance, other DNOs are coming to visit us. We're going to share all that knowledge with them. You know, we expect it to be a two-way traffic, so knowledge shared is knowledge gained. And that's my contact details. That's the project. So if you Google NIA Project Unified Protection, you'll see all the presentations, the white papers. I need to write some more white papers about it, but uh, I will get there eventually. Okay, so the conclusions then. So we needed a new strategy. We do not... Uh, deliver any 61850 solutions at the minute, so this is a complete new strategy for us, and we thought we like to stay the same for a long time. That's what our operational staff like to do. They like to see the same consistent bus coming through every time. So what, what I thought was, let's go to the latest that's available in the marketplace. Let's work with the suppliers. Let's get the gaps that we need them to plug, and the suppliers are working very, uh, very well with us at the moment. We identified opportunities to drastically reduce the substation footprint and also, and very importantly, is uh, we are looking to extend into reducing OPEX from maintenance. So if we can start using some of the logical nodes and look at I squared T that circuit breakers have brought, we don't need to do post fault maintenance as every three circuit breaker opens. We can do it a lot more intelligently. So if it's just breaking low current because the fault current's right at the end of the line, it doesn't need to be maintained for the oil breakers. Uh, great opportunities to complete full system testing. So like I said, um, reducing the footprint is not just cost. If you want to do a full protection replacement, you just drop your centralized system in, you can do a full test on it before you even switch a circuit out. So that's a, a huge risk away from the network that you know you've got a working system before you uh, start switching any, any circuits out. And what of course, we're going to be looking to do is I need to get that uh, 30 odd thousand relays off the network and get a more data rich environment to feed into active network management, wide area protection schemes, and, uh, and of course, anything else that we manage to stumble across as we're developing these systems, we, we might find other uses for them as well. So we want to get some additional funding from the regulator in the ED2 period, which starts in 2023. So one of the purposes of this pilot is to make sure that we can see Tortex savings and make sure that we can demonstrate to the regulator that by rolling these systems out, we will see a huge benefit to the end customer. And that's it. Any questions? Okay, very good.